What we're going through now is not just a technical issue of economic catch-up, uh, which is the kind of the cute way to describe it, but it's really about a regime change in the global system. There'll be exciting opportunities, no doubt, uh, business opportunities, personal opportunities, and so on, but also great uncertainty as the United States and China, as the world's biggest economies and the largest debtor and creditor countries, respectively, maneuver, cooperate, and confront each other. Good evening. I'm Sarwar Kashmiri. I'm a fellow of the Foreign Policy Association, and I have been uh, delegated to uh, introduce our uh, well-known speaker and to moderate the event. So I'm very, very pleased to uh, welcome Mr. George Magnus to uh, a Foreign Policy Association event. Uh, Mr. Magnus is uh, widely viewed as one of Europe's best strategic thinkers. He's well known for his uh, Minsky moment call on the global financial crises. Uh, when he suggested in February 2008, uh, and I'll repeat the date, February 2008, that we are likely facing a trillion dollar financial meltdown. And fixing the problem goes way beyond simple monetary policy remedies and will have to include legislative and regulatory fixes. Where were you when we needed you, George? <laughs> He's written numerous articles uh, in leading publications and two books, including his uh, new uprising, which uh, he will speak about today. Uh, and it will be available for sale after the, uh, uh, after the talk. Uh, he is a managing director and senior economic advisor of UBS Investment Bank. Uh, prior to that, he's held senior positions at SG Warburg, Chase Securities, Bank of America, and Lloyds Bank. I was fascinated to, uh, uh, to know, George, that uh, you have a master's in economics from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Uh, and also that you have done a great deal of research on employment creation. Now, if my good friend uh, Noel Latif, the president of FPA, had asked me to title this, uh, this event, which fortunately he did not do, I would have called it, What is a Poor Westerner to Do? Experts tell us, George, that China and India were responsible for over half of global economic output for some 2,000 years. And it's only the since the Industrial Revolution that the Western economies have interrupted this state of affairs. So I guess you can say that we're going back to the way God intended the universe to work. And should we just stop worrying about growth and employment and learn Hindi and Mandarin and just take it easy till the inevitable happens? Experts tell us that America is in bondage to China because of all of the uh, debt that they own. So what then do we make of the news tomorrow that uh, the Fed now owns more securities than China does? Are we out of bondage, George? Free to get up? Then we've all heard the last few years that there's no point in crying over <laughs> I think there is a message here. <laughs> if you take God's name in vain, you are plunged into darkness. <laughs> what I was going to say, though, I've passed God now, is we've all heard that over the last few years, manufacturing jobs, no point in crying over manufacturing jobs. They've all gone east and, and, and love it there and the economies of production have left the West behind, uh, and uh, we should all focus on services. So what then to make of Mr. Jeffrey Emmelt and President Obama, who not too long ago said that we must, in the U.S., become a manufacturing economy again if we are to have an equitable resurgence of, uh, of employment. So what is a poor Westerner to do? So please join me in welcoming to the FPA Mr. George Magnus, who will talk about uprising, will emerging market shape or shake the world economy? Welcome, George. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sawar, and um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you to the 
uh, FPA for inviting me here this evening. <clears throat> uh, actually, the issues I'm going to talk about um, tonight, uh, I'm sure many of you will recognize as topics which uh, are included in the FPA's Great Decisions Discussion Program, which embrace uh, the financial crisis, uh, US-China relations, uh, global governance, multilateralism, and all these things. The title of the book, uh, Uprising, uh, I'd like to claim uh, the foresight for having seen uh, developments in Egypt in the week that I was here in the United States, but unfortunately, as you'll know, that's complete baloney. Um, the uprising that I was referring to was slightly different, though I'm quite happy to milk uh, all the plaudits for having been astute uh, with the choice of my book title. Uh, but what it is, actually, Uprising is a financial crisis book in a way, uh, but it's a financial crisis book with a bit of a difference. Uh, so it's not about who was to blame and who should we have incarcerated um, and um, how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again. So I'm just putting this up here somewhere so that I don't overrun my time slot. There we go. Um, <clears throat> uh, so it's not about the crisis itself, actually, but it's about how the crisis has shocked uh, the West into an uncertain period. I don't know, nobody knows how long it's going to last, but it's not going to last just two years. Uh, hopefully it won't last as long as Japan's, which is still carrying on after 20 years. But it's shocked us into an uncertain period during which you know, we have to lower and reduce our debt burdens, the household sector, the banking sector, government sector, of course. And if we're smart, it'll shock us into doing some economic restructuring um, along the lines that were highlighted by the President in his State of the Union message. Um, but it's also shocked the world into a different sort of economic reform and restructuring as well um, in emerging countries and accelerated something that has been going on probably for about 20, 25 years, a little bit kind of below the radar screen to begin with, but now much more obvious, which is what I've called the Great Economic Convergence, um, which is, of course, a mirror image of what's been happening since... 1750 to 1800, as Sawa alluded to. Um, <clears throat> so this is a strongly, there is a strongly held view, um, uh, passionately debated by both sides of the argument, I guess, that we are, unfortunately, it's our misfortune to be living through the irre irreversible decline of the West uh, and a period of time which is going to end up <clears throat> with China ruling the world. There was a book that came out uh, a year or two, uh, a year or two ago, called "Not If, but When China Rules the World." So <clears throat> it's kind of what I'd like to kind of discuss a little bit, not just the kind of long, long term, but also uh, the path towards whatever future uh, holds in the next um, five, ten, fifteen years. So when I ask when emer if emerging markets are going to shape or shake the world economy, I'm basically saying that this great convergence, this reversal of 200 years of world history uh, will unquestionably shape the world, and probably for the better. Um, <clears throat> the next billion consumers, uh, the growth of emerging market companies, uh, the rise in global prosperity, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I'm also going to say that this path depends very much on the willingness and ability of the major emerging countries, and I'll talk a lot about China inevitably, to undergo significant changes in the way that they interact with other countries and with their own citizens. And if they can't adapt or accommodate those changes, then I think, to quote Jerry Lee Lewis, there certainly will be a whole lot of shaking going on. And we can see manifestations of that even today. And what this all suggests, of course, then, is that what we're going through now is not just a technical issue of economic catch-up. Uh, which is the kind of the cute way to describe it. But it's really about a regime change in the global system. There'll be exciting opportunities, no doubt, uh, business opportunities, personal opportunities, and so on, but also great uncertainty as the United States and China, as the world's biggest economies and the largest debtor and creditor countries, respectively, maneuver, cooperate, and confront each other drawing in Europe and other major emerging countries to establish what they hope will be a new and stable global system. We, we shall see. 
Of course, in the process of doing this, we should be aware that the exciting things that uh, underline the case for economic convergence, economic progress, can also create forces which undermine it. So as well as shaping and shaking, you've got undermining and underlining as well. So just to take an example, in the West, um, the same kind of economic system that brought us the information revolution and the prosperity of the last uh, 20, 25 years, of course, has also been responsible for creating huge imbalance in our societies in the form of income inequality, and also been responsible for the biggest financial crisis since the 1930s, and also for unprecedented levels of public debt. By the same token, in China, the last 20, 25 years have produced a fourfold rise in income per head to about $4,000. But they've also produced an exceptionally unbalanced economy, rising inflation, and a restructuring agenda in China, which is economically difficult and politically very risky for the Communist Party. So much of what I'd like to talk about then is not so much about the short-term prospects uh, specifically, but about these structural issues that China and some other emerging markets face uh, from now onwards, and why they have to tackle them head on or actually risk instability. Uh, so straight lines into the future, not accepted in, uh, in my world. And if you just wanted a kind of a reminder about why emerging markets are called emerging, and why a lot of investors have suddenly had a bit of a shock, um, having um, assumed that actually they were almost the equivalent of risk-free assets. Uh, of course, you just have to look at Tunisia, Algeria, uh, Egypt, of course, as testament to the impact that uh, repressive governments and authoritarian regimes can have when you provide a spark in the form of rising food prices, which of course matter a lot to poorer people for whom food is 35, 55% of the family budget. I never like to link Egypt and China in one sentence this week uh, because the stretch is almost too much to be credible. But what's happening in Egypt should resonate in China uh, and other authoritarian countries uh, where individual liberty is uh, suppressed. Obviously, the Chinese can get away with it because they can almost guarantee, at least for the time being, steady 10% per annum economic growth and rising prosperity. But nothing about that is preordained or uh, fixed in terms of time. So <clears throat> my profession uh, in the world of economics, um, we can do all sorts of wizard things. We can help you understand what the implications are of, quote, rising economic significance. What difference does it make if China or in India produce half of the world's uh, growth, not necessarily output as such, but the growth in uh, the world's output actually has largely been determined by China, India, and emerging countries. So we can, we can talk at great length and at great wisdom about where the next one billion consumers in the world will be. Which shopping malls will they stalk? What will they buy? How will their consumption patterns change as emerging countries become progressively more urban and modern? Uh, <clears throat> we can talk about how companies that are headquartered in emerging markets now represent about 20% of the Fortune 500. And uh, a growing proportion of them are generating huge sales. Uh, I mean, in excess of $10 billion a year, there are a dozen emerging market companies that have sales in excess of $100 billion a year. Uh, we can talk about uh, the steady advances in technology. Uh, China, for example, already is a world leader in low carbon and green alternative clean air kind of technologies. And some experts, not my field to be honest, some experts think that in the area of nanotechnology, which is the, the science of actually building products from molecules, um, <clears throat> very, very complicated, but also very, um, very modern and the, the future, that this industry could be worth two and a half trillion dollars by 2015, and that China could be, could be, not, pre, not fixed, but could be one of the first uh, countries outside of the West to pioneer uh, a modern technology of this nature. So all of these things can be assimilated and incorporated and anticipated in our models and our spreadsheets and all that kind of stuff, but with severe and very, very important limitations. <clears throat> 
So let me give you an example. If you had all of the economic information that you needed uh, at the time, say in 1900, you could probably have predicted that the United States would one day uh, rule the world system. And if you weren't actually wise up to that in 1900, by 1920 it was pretty much a done deal. Um, but could you have anticipated the course which would have happened in world history that would have led to that outcome? Almost certainly not. Um, and we shouldn't forget either that many people have confidently predicted in the past uh, at various points that Germany would rule the world, that the USSR would rule the world, that Japan would rule the world most recently, uh, and all of these things actually worked out rather differently than expected. So these predictions always have to be taken with a little bit of a pinch of salt and with context. What I'm trying to say really is that there are much more important things to look at in looking at the future than just GDP forecasting and accounting. What you need is what we call in the industry, in our industry at least, a killer app, a killer application um, to, sustain, to, to sustain successful economic development. And that's really about good government and high quality institutions that enable you to accumulate capital and keep social cohesion uh, together. Uh, these institutions, by the way, for the sake of uh, reference, because I'll refer to them uh, a few times, they include things like the legal system, including neutral uh, contract enforcement and independent judiciary. Uh, they include sound political governance, effective labor organizations, good social organizations that facilitate social change, an innovative environment, uh, transformational corporate culture, and things like that. If you apply these things properly and develop them, uh, you can turn labor, human capital, physical capital, all of the inputs into GDP, you can turn them into something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. Uh, in our nerdy world, we call this total factor productivity. That's the magic kind of potion that we can't really measure, but it's what guarantee or describes basically durable economic success. Two authors at the INSEAD Business School <clears throat> recently published a paper showing how as you become richer, uh, in terms of income per head, you need to sustain better and better quality institutions in order to keep your economic progress on track. So if you're very poor, if you have per capita income of 500 bucks or $1,000, actually you can have a disproportionate effect in terms of economic success simply by building factories, putting kids into school, and you know, expanding public health and these kinds of things. But once you start knocking on the door of about $10,000 per capita, uh, you'll stagnate, they argue, unless you can build high quality institutions that are flexible uh, and that can nurture successful change. And you must be tolerant, of course, of uh, disruption and be able to manage it. Uh, so there are lots of examples we have. Uh, would the United Kingdom and the United States and other Western economies have been able to achieve what they had done, industrial, the Industrial Revolution and what came afterwards, if they had not already established a very coherent, flexible institutional infrastructure of enterprise, commerce, and law, most historians doubt it. Would South America, uh, Southeast Asia have been able to pull so far ahead of Latin America over the last 40 years, bearing in mind that they started more or less at the same place in 1970? Would they have been able to do that without building much, much stronger and better quality institutions, particularly in education and research, very doubtful. Uh, would China uh, or would India have been able to catch up India? So, it's getting it the wrong way around. Would India have been able to catch up China over the last 20 years if, it had, if India had had at the time uh, the kinds of institutions which China has today, uh, possibly? Uh, and you look further, just further south from here, I mean, Brazil's transformation since President Cardozo has been remarkable uh, to being a kind of the darling of the emerging universe as it is. Uh, but this also wouldn't have happened without profound changes to the way, not what uh, the Brazilian government did over eight to ten years, but how it was governed, uh, as well as what it was governing. So, uh, just to kind of bring it up to the present day then, in China, uh, the last 10 or 15 years have been miraculous when you look at the development of state-owned enterprises, uh, the rise of several global companies, and the resources which have been plowed into research and development, product development, and so on. Um, and these results you can see. China is the biggest exporter in the world and a leader in many technologies, as I've already described. And yet, and yet, I don't think things can go on as they have been. 
State enterprises and local government infrastructures, for example, thrive on underpriced capital, easy credit, and a cheap exchange rate. They lack the organizational and management skills which are evident in top global companies, uh, which we are more familiar with. They don't really have programs for managing diversity and disruption. And changing these phenomena is likely to prove politically challenging and almost certainly economically disruptive. And this is the challenge that I think China and others face over the next 10 or 15 years. By 2020, um, it's possible, probable, that China's per capita income will treble again to maybe twelve or $13,000. Um, and <clears throat> the point about that is that the continued development at that point or after that point won't really happen in the way that we can project on spreadsheets um, unless there is a new round of comprehensive economic and probably political reforms. And these are serious questions which you can raise about China without being accused about being a basher. Um, but it really is about political will and about the quality of China's institutions, <coughs> which traditionally have been China's soft underbelly, not just in the last 50 years, but over the last two and a half thousand years. The case of technology, I think, illustrates my point well. And it's something which I think we're all going to be more uh, cognizant of because technology is the future. I mean, I'm not just being cute by saying that, but, you know, we've got a problem with food. I mean, food prices we know is a problem. It's a structural problem. We don't grow enough relative to the demand which we've got, and we uh, have a lot of ways in which we're undermining the capacity of arable land to meet our demands in the future. Technology can solve the problem. Technology can solve many of our problems as we get older, aging societies. Uh, technology is the way that we'll innovate our way out of the financial crisis and so on. So as far as emerging markets are concerned, I mean, nobody now thinks of them as a global reservoir of just cheap labor and low-cost brains. Uh, the transformational effects of the internet, mobile phones in Africa in particular, wireless technologies, etc., are well known, and the brick economies have become key players in many uh, well-known industries, automobile engineering, energy exploration, development, information, bio, etc., etc. Uh, many of these countries you'll be you know, very familiar with you, particularly South Korea, but in the uh, developing world or the emerging world, high achievers would also include countries such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Mexico, and Turkey, for example. But to be a top dog in technology uh, and a leader in innovation, you have to have, guess what, high quality and very flexible institutions that are tolerant and nurturing of disruptive change. The World Bank, for example, recently published a report in which they said that emerging countries face a whole range of constraints embedded in their political and legal systems, uh, which hinder broad-based innovation. Some of these I just referred to a little bit in China's case, but they also include weak incentives for transform transformational entrepreneurship, limitations about access to high-quality post-secondary education, uh, research facilities that actually lag a long way uh, behind hours. So if you look at the top 500 universities in the world, you have to go to 52 before you find a Chinese name. Most of the top 10 are American and British.